Well, central banks are cutting rates in the hope that it's going to stop panic in the money markets, and to an extent it has stopped the rapid dip in equities that we saw last week. But investors are still rushing to buy bonds and safe haven currencies. But more importantly... What's it going to do to help businesses who suffer a lack of customers as we all stay at home and self-quarantine? So if this virus gets to be a big problem, what should governments do to keep us from total economic collapse? That's this week on the Debunking Economics podcast with Professor Steve Keen. I'm Phil Dobby. So, Steve, we have seen a uh, a massive decline in manufacturing numbers from China in data we saw at the weekend. The OECD has warned that the coronavirus could halve global growth this year. That could mean a global recession. They're not saying that's definitely what's going to happen. In fact, they've just cut their forecast for global growth from 2.9% to 2.4%. But in the same breath, they're saying if this virus is sustained, it could mean growth of just 1.5%. The response from central banks and the G7 central bankers are getting on the phone together today to discuss it. It's some sort of coordinated cut in interest rates. Obviously, their concern is with the impact with the banking sector. So, I mean, we stop buying risky equities. That's what we have been seeing. We've seen this rush into buying government bonds. That's pushed bond yields down. So then the central bank response is, well, we're going to push interest rates down as well. Can you explain how that's going to help the, the banking sector and, um, you know... Oh, look, mate, it, it's, it's going to be fabulous. It's going to be such a tremendous job. It's like giving somebody aspirin when they have uh, pneumonia. That <laughs> was <laughs> totally irrelevant. And um, this is what amuses me about it. Initially, the initial response is, uh, let's change interest rates because that's the only policy that lever that central banks have allowed themselves for the last 30 years in the belief they could manage the economy effectively. Well, of course, that worked brilliantly in 2008. Um, and they threw that for what they call unconventional monetary policies, uh, which is what rescued the stock market dramatically. Of course, that's what turned it around. That's what's still powering it in many ways. So why say um, why why if, why do we want to push equities up? Why do we want to see uh, share prices, which are sort of you know until this were at record levels? Why do they want to see them climbing again? I would have thought uh, just let them rest. Surely, what's the problem with doing that? Well, that, that, that actually, even if we're getting away from the coronavirus itself directly, but that's that's the philosophy that, that Ben Bernanke put forward was we want to generate the wealth effect. So yeah. that uh, stock the prices have crashed so much, uh, we, we interest rates are at zero. We can't do anything to stimulate by dropping rates any further. So let's use what the, 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 what the a bastardized version of what the, the Japanese did, and which Richard Werner is the person who turned the, the phrase quantitative easing, but he had something more sophisticated in mind than simply buying bonds off the, off the private financial sector and therefore encouraging them to buy shares to drive up the share prices. But that's all Bernanke saw going on, and his argument was if people feel wealthier, they'll spend more money, right. and that will stimulate but the economy. That so doesn't apply now. In any case, look, the, uh, the, cor- the correction that we saw last week, the S&P 500 is still over 3,000. It only got into uh, above 3,000 and stayed there and continued growing in October last year. So who's really losing except for, you know, short-term investors who bet on it going even further and more fool them? And if we think that uh, that banks are going to be tied up in, in this loss and we'll see banks collapse, I mean, I thought we had stress tests on banks to make sure that they didn't make foolish investment decisions like that. Yeah, but the thing is, the stress tests uh, are nothing like the level of stress they're under with something like the coronavirus. They're, all these stress tests are designed for episodic failures. They're looking at, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't look at the contagion effect, which is hilarious now because we are talking about one serious case of contagion, mm. and yet they're still thinking in very linear ways. Um, so the the idea that you can save everything by dropping interest rates or even that doing standard old QE uh, will somehow get the economy through this, it just doesn't work uh, because even on the share the QE front, front, the idea that it causes the wealth effect. A little research body with the, with the obscure name of the Federal Reserve published a paper about 15 years ago saying when they went looking for the wealth effect with shares, there was none. The only wealth effect they could find was a minor one with house prices. Yeah. So you know, it, it hasn't done what they wanted it to do in terms of directly stimulating the economy by private sector consumption. Uh, it's it's been the indirect flowover that's had any real impact on the real economy. Well, who's going to be who's going to be buying shares in a in a company that is suffering because people aren't buying its products because they're they're stuck at home and they can't produce those products anyway because their workers are stuck at home as well. I mean it. it it's foolish, to, yeah, it's foolish to expect that we're going to see <laughs> massive growth in share prices, surely. 
Yeah, that's just one of my, that's why I think is the, the old-fashioned QE won't work to continue supporting share prices once the scale of the coronavirus impact yeah. on commerce becomes blatant. Because if you give the idea is an indirect thing, you you uh, you being the Federal Reserve pump. $80 billion a month, and that's what they were doing during pool QE, $80 billion a month into the financial sector. They get the cash, they hand over the bonds to you. Now, they've got the cash, which doesn't return a yield, so therefore, if they're looking for yield, what they'll do is they'll go and buy shares. And that's, what, of course, what happened when the when S&P bottomed at uh, 666 points uh, mm-hmm. back in, I think, about sometime in 2010. And since then, it's you know, rocketed up to the you know, hitting towards the, you know, the, the 3,000 levels that it is these days. Um, but if you try to do it again now and say, please buy risky assets when those risky assets are going bankrupt because um, yeah. the, the, the companies aren't selling anything, the workers can't produce anything, I, I think that it's going to sit on the money. It won't, it won't have the same effect anymore. I mean, even you know what they're trying in China, where the central bank is freeing up the reserves for the commercial bank, supposedly so they can unleash more lending again. Uh, they're not going to do that, if it, are they? If, if lending to a... They can't. A high- there's, the, there's the other myth. We've got a bunch of myth believers running running global economies, and one of those myths is that the banks actually bend reserves out. Now, thank God the Bank of England uh, in 2014 pointed out that was a myth, but it's still the way politicians, uh, a lot of the public, and uh, and bureaucrats running central banks still think uh, they've got two ineffective tools. Well, I think they're saying, no, we'll reduce the amount of reserves you need so that you can lend more out. So, But, I mean, you're not going to lend more out, are you? Because you're not going to lend to a company that you think is going to go bankrupt because no one's buying from it. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 we're just looking at a, a complete failure mm. of conventional tools. So we've got to start thinking of unconventional ones because um, this is going to cause a large number of bankruptcies both on the on the corporate, on the non financial corporate side, and on the on the side of workers, and that has to feed through to banks, which are one of the you know, institutions that central banks see themselves as protecting. So it sounds like what you're saying is then, when it, however we solve it, however we get money to where it's needed, it shouldn't go through the finance sector. This is this is a problem for governments to solve, not for banks to solve. Yeah, well, this is this is one time we we, we cannot imagine the, the private sector solution to a systemic crisis like the coronavirus. This is something where, in fact, everything the private sector normally does will make this sort of crisis worse. Mm. So if you insist that companies uh, have to be able to pay their debts as and when they fall due, which is standard bankruptcy rules, uh, if given the fact that corporations are now carrying the highest level of, of, of corporate debt to GDP in history, and this is... This is um, quite different to household debt the, the if the household sector in america deleveraged after the financial after the financial crisis uh, so did the corporate sector until qe began and then since qe's happened they've gone from a peak a level of private uh, debt to gdp at the bottom of the downturn in mid 2012 of 66% of gdp it is now 75% and that exceeds the previous peak which is reached during the um, of the, the great recession of 72% so we've got the most, the corporate sector being the most indebted it's ever been, and the workforce that works for them is the most fragile it's ever been mm. because of the gig economy, all the insecurity, the the, the lack of full time jobs, and so on. Um, so the real economy, which is what we actually are trying to save with all this stuff, is, will be on its knees with coronavirus, and we have to get the federal to, federal reserves powers redirected towards the real economy this time, rather than just towards the banks. So is it the Federal Reserve, or is it the is it central governments to do this? Because the company, I mean, it is vast, isn't it? Travel companies, international education, entertainment restaurants. I mean, they're the obvious ones that are going to be hit hard by this because they will just have no business whatsoever. But then, as you say, there's all those, uh, the gig economy, the freelance workers, and, and generally every company is going to take a hit because, uh, you know, whatever you're selling, you're going to be selling less of it. You know, the only people who are going to make a fortune actually are toilet roll manufacturers. <laughs> I'm just, I, every supermarket I've been into uh, in the last <laughs> couple of days is empty of toilet rolls. Everybody is backing up on toilet rolls. So, if you want to go to the, to the toilet, we're going to be fully prepared. You want to feed yourself, it could be a problem. Mm. So, um, it, it's 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 ironic how we react to all these things. But yeah, it's the, the scale of the shock is so great that we have to say, let's use those those, those tools differently. And I, 
I don't think that fiscal stimulus will be enough or fast enough. We have to get money directly into people's bank accounts and we have to avoid, uh, let companies that are forced to um, be unable to pay their debts during the coronavirus crisis, which might last up one year, two years. As long as it lasts, we've got to stop them going bankrupt because of it and uh, and stop uh, individuals going bankrupt, being able to pay their, unable to pay their rents unable to pay their mortgages, and frankly, for someone able to pay for food. Um, Which is exactly what Scott Scott Morrison in Australia has said he won't do. So Kevin Rudd, of course, I think it's just about the only place in modern times where this has been tried, where he, uh, during the 2008 crisis, actually put money directly into our bank accounts to try and boost spending. Hmm. Scott Morrison said we won't be doing that. Um, but would it do much anyway? Oh, good. Another thing you said he won't be doing that he's going to be doing. That's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah. to join the list. But, I mean, it, if, if it's there to pay, to pay off debt, I mean, if you give it to everybody willy-nilly, is it, is it actually going to be th- that effective? Because we're not, we're not going to go out to shop. So for a lot of people who aren't on the, uh, on the borderline, all they're going to do is pay, pay off their, their mortgage that little bit more. How do you, um, you know, if we're self-quarantined, we're, we're not going to spend our way out of this problem, are we? It's not going to help companies sell more stuff. All it will do if you're putting money into people's bank accounts is it's going to stop them going bankrupt. If they, it's going to pay for their mortgage, it's going to pay for their rent. Yeah, and well, that's the thing we have to avoid because what, what, we, what we face right now is a, it's, it's, a, it's a pandemic. And there's no, no doubt of that. The, the fact that WHO refused to clear it one because they were worried about global trade is a sign of how perverted our public institutions have become by focusing upon commerce rather than what they're actually supposed to do. But with this virus, we have twice the level of corporate debt that applied during the last uh, pandemic, which was the Spanish flu, and three times the level of private debt compared to GDP that we had back then. So, And financially, we're in a very fragile situation. And at the same time, when the, when that, when the Spanish flu began, it was actually in, it began in January of 1918. We're still embroiled in the First World War. Uh, you had a large part of the population either in the army or working directly for the army. Uh, so there was an income distribution which was independent of the private sector, and debts were one third the level that they are now. Uh, so there was no you know, knockdown financial fragility back then. There is potentially knockdown financial fragility now, and we have to do something about it. So do we, uh, for example, give companies, if we, if we look at it from a company point of view rather than indiv- individuals, we can w- work our way through this. But if we started with companies and, say, and said, well, if you are close to bankruptcy, um, we will give you some sort of, I mean, it, it exists now where you have some sort of safe haven, some sort of sa- a safe harbor mm. uh, if, you, if you're if you getting financial help to, uh, if, you, if you're getting a, uh, like a turnaround consultant to try and help your business. So that, that, so you, you're, you're saved from uh, running a, a company that's on, on the verge of bankruptcy or, or is insolvent. You, you're solved from, uh, uh, you, you don't face the legal repercussions of that. So do we sort of extend that sort of legislation and say, you know, plus you can have an interest-free loan for whatever period, for a year or two years, to to get you over this uh, over this hurdle. Something I think even more extreme than that, because we are going to see corporations going bankrupt because they're no longer able to a to produce output because the supply chain is disrupted from China. Uh, so the production will be impossible. They're going to lose demand as well. They're only going to be people who are, are selling directly into what people regard as emergency purchases. I mean, I made the facetious, slightly facetious remark about toilet roll manufacturers, but you know, them sanitize, hand sanitizers, uh, masks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, they're going to burn through the roof. But the vast majority of normal uh, in- industries, you know, from tra- from transportation, education, uh, food. Uh, restaurant food, obviously, more so than, than purchased food, um, they're going to suffer dramatically. And in that situation, unless we do something, they're going to go bankrupt, which means they'll put their workers out of work, which means the workers won't be able to pay their own bills, which means the workers will be unable to pay their mortgages, and it feeds through the whole financial sector. So we have to do something, uh, both letting companies operate when they'd normally be made insolvent, uh, potentially actually classifying companies and saying, we are going to give you a, a cash flow from the government in the meantime to keep you to make up for the damage to your cash flow from the coronavirus and I think we've got to do what I've been arguing for ages uh, about solving the the cause of the last financial crisis we need a, not a modern debt jubilee but a, mo- a modern virus jubilee <laughs> but it to the we've same. got to get money directly into, ha- into the bank accounts of, of individuals and households right 
but I mean that could that, I mean that could be huge. You could be talking about uh, a, a massive amount of money, which is which, some of which you, you know you could argue is going to be misdirected because there's going to be people who are doing fine, sort of retirees who uh, have got their money sitting in in, in safe bonds. Uh, who who are not going to struggle through this crisis at all? Apart from the fact they're elderly, they might yeah, die. That, but that, that's 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 what I mean, the whole the argument I made for a modern debt jubilee about a decade ago was to say we should give debt uh, give, give government created money on a per capita basis, so everybody gets the same amount of money. Um, that's going to benefit the poor far more than it does the rich, mm. uh, and that's the ones we're worried about are people who are on insecure jobs, the gig economy part of the world. And uh, we want we want to find a way to get money into their hands. Uh, in, in the original case, was so that we could reduce debt and not have the moral hazard issue that those who didn't get into debt got nothing, which is what happens with the, the right. standard jubilee. But what this time around, we want to get cash in. Yeah, yeah. But what? Okay, and that's the repercussion of businesses closing down and people finding themselves unemployed and they can't afford to pay their bills. But I mean, the ideal, obviously, is hmm. that we don't get to that stage and we want to keep companies going. How do we? Because do, that doesn't solve that problem, does it? And there's going to be some companies that are close to failure and other companies that are are going to manage to somehow uh, scrape through uh, through this crisis. How to deal with that? Because I mean, there has been talk about, uh, for example, in some places. Well, if you're if you're running losses at a certain level, then we'll give you some support. But of course, we all know it's fairly easy to make a company make a loss. You know, on paper, uh, you just buy a few things that uh, you didn't intend to buy. Uh, I'll I'll build another studio, for example, and I can make a loss very easily. Um, so how? Yeah, but I think this this is one we we can identify the industries are going to suffer. Yeah. Um, very, oh. In terms of consumer demand, we can identify that straight away. Yeah. Uh, but do, so do we, so do we say, though, though as a, do we say then that at the end of this, we think companies should come out of this crisis exactly the same as it went in, which could cost a lot of money? Well, I don't think we should. This is, this is a genuine systemic crisis. Okay. It is something which you can't blame any, on any individual. The question is, what do you want to have happen? Do you want to have the system collapse more because we leave, we leave uh, resilience? as an individual level action, or do we take them collective action, which we can do? And if the collective action has some unfortunate consequences, they're not quite as unfortunate as letting the system run on its own. This, this, this is a classic reason why you can't say you can have an individual rem- remedy to a systemic crisis. It's like saying, you know, you should have brought your own paddle on the Titanic. Uh, you know, why haven't you got your own, why, why don't you bring your own pa- uh, canoe with you? I'm sorry. Uh, if you've got to know, provide enough, uh, you know, Boats on the on the Titanic in the first place. Uh, now we're in a Titanic situation here in the sense that if the coronavirus can only be stopped by shutting down commerce for effectively some of the order of one or two months, and that's quite feasible, then you've got to provide some way that people can survive that period, uh, which you, you can't be reliant upon their own cash flows so, because they won't have one. So I run an Indian restaurant, and gee, that would be a good life. Uh, and uh, but I'm going through a difficult time. I close the, I close down the doors, and uh, the government gives me enough money for me to be able to pay my workers and myself, so that when the crisis is over in a few months' time, I can open the doors and resume business as normal. Is that what you're you're suggesting? This yeah, pretty much. Time? I don't I don't want this to have financial consequences. If it does, it'll make the situation far worse. Right, but who's, so the money the money paid for that would come from. The government from central banks. Who, who is going to be paying for me? Central to- banks. I mean, it's, 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 this, this is what QE has been. If you look at QE, the one advantage of QE, it was a, you know, it's, an, it's a, been a very ineffective policy compared to what could have been done, but it did work. Uh, in the, and, and there was obviously no limit to the capacity of the government to do it. They simply bought bonds for you know eighty billion dollars a month. The U.S. government was on the buy side of its open market operations with financial institutions. And it put, so put $80 billion worth of cash net in, uh, in the financial sector's bank accounts every month. It recorded $80 billion worth of bonds on its asset side, and it can do that indefinitely. So, so what it could do instead yeah. Yeah, is I, potentially it could, it could, in, in, in listed companies, it could buy shares instead at the same level, which would support share prices and also give those firms a cash flow. Uh, if they're issuing new shares, but how does that uh, help there, the small business? How, how does that help my Indian restaurant? Small business, you've got to have a provision. Say, okay, which small business is going to get hit by this? And clearly, you know, anything in education, transportation, uh, direct personal services, uh, all this sort of stuff is going to be hit. Uh, their cash flows are going to plunge, and it's obvious they're going to plunge because once it gets severe, you'd be, you know, you'd be actually risking not just your own health, but public health, to go and use any of these facilities. 
So talk me through how that gets the decision from the central bank to me at my Indian restaurant. How does that work in practice? Well, that would not be the cent- that would not be the central bank. That, that would, would have to be the government yeah. having a set of rules saying which businesses are we going to regard as being hit by this. Obviously, if you're making t- toilet rolls, don't don't come begging, okay? Um, unless you run out of paper because you're no longer getting supplies from China. So it, 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 there's, a, there's a supply chain issue and there's a demand issue. We know there won't be, there's not going to be a negative demand issue on people hoarding. And buying and buying food that's going to be a huge boost initially anybody producing dried foods uh, you know anything which 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 can last in for a substantial period of time they're they're going to be winning on demand everybody else is going to be losing so we so have so we you, have you know, we have central banks uh, basically extending the money supply through QE which they're using to uh, to, to invest in in equities in in, in the share market we have uh, central governments uh, basically running debt uh, which again is extending the money supply so that they can support these these businesses that would otherwise go against the wall. So we are talking about a big, big increase in the money supply through through all of this, aren't we? Like a massive increase, which normally we'd say would yeah, be but, would be inflationary. Yeah, but the thing is, what you've got is a plunge in the turnover of money, and this this is the, you know I often come back to people obsessing about the money supply and forgetting about its turnover, mm. and That's this right. is one classic case: people are not going to be spending. Yeah, you know, and so you, you, if you if you have a plunge in the velocity of money, one way to to counter that is to have an increase in the supply of it. How do you pull and back in a, few, step- in a few months' time yeah. when my restaurant opens again and everything's all fine? This uh, this virus has strangely been eradicated. How do we pull back that that supply and money? Well, I mean, what it might also do is end up reducing the level of private debt compared to GDP, and I would not be crying any tears over that. Mm-hmm. Now, I propose a, a modern debt jubilee, and people ask me, what are the odds of this happening? I would say negative, okay? It's just simply not going to happen. Now, a modern debt jubilee uh, directed at the virus rather than the directly, directly at private debt may be the only way to stop this turning from a, a, a viral cont- contagion into a financial contagion that could break the financial system. So we need to also change laws around bankruptcy, obviously, wouldn't we, in the short term? I, mean, yeah, I haven't heard, yeah, that, I haven't heard yeah. that being discussed, and yet it seems like the most obvious thing to talk about first. Yeah, you, yeah. How do we stop yeah, businesses you, you going to the wall? You, well, let's change the laws yeah. around it. Yeah, you've got to change the laws around banks as well, because mm. uh, even though, like, you know, of course, if banks have got shareholdings and the shareholders have been pumped up by QE, then, of course, they've got massive positive equity buffer right now. But when they start finding their customers can't pay their debt, uh, when if there is a huge sell-off in shares, and that's quite feasible, even with QE, um, then you know, when this really hits, then lots of banks could find themselves with negative equity, and therefore they would normally be forced to declare bankruptcy. And we have to say, no, in the special circumstances here, we'll let you continue operating. Okay? And you've got to let them continue operating. You don't want the monetary system to break down because of the virus, because that will then mean that people simply can't shop yeah. and then we're going to have starvation effects as well as the virus and that will make the virus grow more rapidly. <laughs> I mean, we do, we, it is the problem though, isn't it, that we had in 2008 where we don't want the banks to, to fall down over this, although uh, if, if we don't let the banks collapse, then uh, all we're doing is supporting their behaviour, which obviously has been not to countenance risk uh, in the, the way they operate. So, for example, I wonder whether... Uh, yeah, well, another, another thing we could... Yeah. I wonder whether oh, another thing we could do. Yeah, yeah. you go. Go on. Go on. Sorry. <laughs> another thing we could do is is bring in central bank digital currencies. Yeah, this would be. I know the Bank of Bank thing was looking at this. The Bank of Sweden, uh, China's central bank, a few central banks are looking at bringing in central bank digital currencies. So if that if that existed, if the if the framework existed now, then we could give people money through their central bank accounts. And that would mean you wouldn't necessarily have to support the banks because you could still have transactions using money created by the central banks. But nobody's got there yet. The disease got here before the idea did. Uh, But that's another way that this could be done. I wonder how much of the massive volatility we've seen over the last week is because of the liquidity issues, because dealers have uh, not held inventories. They basically buy and sell quickly. So when there's a panic on, uh, they have to rush to find a, a buyer, so prices dip because they have to sell. If they held bigger inventories, which they did, they used to warehouse bonds quite a bit more right up until 2008, basically. If there was more of that mm. warehousing of bonds, there'd be less panic. Maybe this is the sort of regulation that needs to, to be re 
examine. Maybe we need to get tighter, not just on, on banks, but the broader financial institutions as a result of all of this. Yeah, potentially, but, uh, but it, 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 you know, this is otherwise it's an aberration. I mean, mm. it's an aberration we're going to have to live with because this is one of the points of, of climate change. Uh, I'm not saying coronavirus is caused by climate change, but coronavirus is caused by the same thing which causes climate change, which is excessive human pressure on the biosphere. And therefore, if we're given what climate change is going to bring forward, shocks like this are going to happen all the time. They're not exogenous. We've caused them by overstressing the biosphere. What do you think is going to be the long-term consequence of all of this then? Are we, for example, is is internationalisation more into question? I mean, it it was starting to be anyway, wasn't it? Through Donald Trump's actions, we've seen how precarious international supply lines are, maybe we'll be rethinking all of that. Yeah, I mean, that's globalisation has to, has to pretty much die uh, if we're going to get over climate change in the long term anyway. Mm. This is just a, a bit of a, a foretaste of it because I, I, I've seen, I, I haven't looked to find how long it takes for a container vessel to go from Shanghai to Los Angeles, let's say, but I've been, t- I've seen people saying it's something like two or three weeks. Now, you imagine being a, 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 you know, a seaman uh, hopping onto a boat where you're going to be in a confined space for two, 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 two to four weeks with people who may have the virus. Uh, you're going to voluntarily say, no way, I'm getting on there. And the only way to make it uh, feasible to continue the shipping is to is to quarantine the crew before departure for at least two weeks, maybe four, uh, before they hop on board. Then, once they're quarantined and nobody's got it, then they can take the boat across the, uh, the ocean. That is a sign of how fragile our, our production system has become. And this is where you know, Nassim Taleb's frame is phrase of anti-fragility, I think is really sensible and important. We've designed an incredibly fragile system. Just-in-time manufacturing, which has reduced production costs, relies upon instant, almost instantaneous you know, delivery just in time for the production process. Uh, that works when you, when you have a smoothly functioning global system. When you've got a, a curly like this thrown in, and we've been pushing ourselves further and further this way by overburdening the planet as we have, uh, then that's, you, that's not the system you want. You want to have massive stocks. So we are really very, very fragile to a shock from something like the coronavirus. So you've described what uh, should happen. There will be people, of course, who are saying this all seems a bit extreme. It seems like a, a, an overreaction. What do you what do you actually think will happen? How is that? How are the next is the next month or two going to play out in terms of you know how oh, the I virus is, how the virus is going to spread people. and how the governments are going to react? Yeah, I think they're going to, as usual, they're going to underestimate the dangers and then overreact when they realise just how bad it is. So I've been looking at um, the level of, um, uh, of growth of the of the uh, virus infections in different countries, and I'm just going to read out a set of numbers to people. Um, so this is going to be really fascinating radio. Uh, but the numbers are nice. 43, 12. Zero 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 two 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 three 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 twenty sixty two one fifty five two twenty nine three thirty two four fifty three six sixty five eighty eighty eight one 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 two eight one six nine four two zero three six. Okay, the ninety dollar question: What am I reading out? Uh, is the, the number of cases in Italy. Italy, I was going to say, yeah, lots of zeros there, but the numbers definitely got bigger towards the end. Even I noticed that. All so. of a sudden, okay, you had this mm. period where, it, where it's minor, it's actually seemed to be going away. Then you get this what really is a hyper exponential growth rate. So and you look at the you look at the numbers and say, what's the doubling period? It's two days. Yeah. So like, but, um, it, the but, is it, numbers there. but it, it, is it sustained? That's the question, isn't it? I mean, if it was to double, no, it'll every, fall. It'll yeah. fall. It'll fall from that initial level, but that's the that when it starts taking off. That's how fast it grows. Yeah. And uh, so, like the, the doubling period, and in terms of it revealed cases in Italy, is running at doubling every two days. Now, uh, we're, we're not going to see that rate sustained. It's not that infectious. This is really discovery rather than infection. But it appears to once it settles down, unless you take major efforts to isolate people, which is what China has been doing, its doubling period is about six days. Now, doubling every six days means that by the end of the year, you've got something like 60 times to the two to the 60 times as many cases. Now, if you remember the old story about the um, uh, the, the uh, uh, philosopher who helps a, a king win a battle, and he said, when the king 
says, well, you can have anything you like. And he says, all our sire is one grain of rice on the first square of a chessboard, two on the second, four on the third, et cetera, et cetera. And the king thinks he's got a bargain until he finds his entire kingdom and half the planet's been signed away. So he executes the philosopher. Um, exponential growth catches people by surprise. And our politicians are going to come to this too late. They're going to think it's containable, think they can handle, uh, get away with it, and then... The, inoc- the, the, the virus doesn't listen to politicians. It'll start putting exponential strain, and then we'll finally decide that we've got to do what the Chinese did, which is massive isolation. And massive isolation doesn't work in a capitalist system. We have to find some way over it. Um, we can't do what China has done as drastically, but we've got to find some way to let people isolate themselves and not go bankrupt and not starve. Mm. Okay, and we're going to do that by... To, to, we come out of this with businesses saved, but we come out with central banks having issued a, a, a huge number of uh, of extra extra bonds and companies that not sell- bonds, no, 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 buying shares, buying shares, doing, sorry. Yeah, as sorry. well as as well as as well as like they they, okay. they can create the money. They, they don't have to buy bonds to create the money. They could do what the Bank of England does with uh, the Titans, where to to back the uh, the, the Scottish currency. Uh, they issue issue the currency that the, the Clydesdale Bank and all that mob can produce their own Scottish notes, which circulate in Scotland to some extent in the, in Britain, in uh, in in, the, in, the, uh, the, in in England, and they're backed by one hundred million pound right. notes and called Titans in the Bank of England. So but yeah, so basically like writing their own check. They could do the same thing. thing. Right. Okay. Yeah. So they so, okay. So they're they're buying equities and they're they're making a call on on which ones they're buying. Similarly. Uh, the governments are there saying, well, okay, we're going to rack up some debt, but that's fine because we can create money to cover that debt, but we're going to pick pick our winners in terms of the businesses that need supporting. We're going to have a lot of very disillusioned people who are saying, well, okay, you didn't pick my business. I've been struggling financially as well, and this this finished me off, even though I wasn't one of the ta- the target industries. I mean, it's... I, think I don't, I don't know how you, you administer just, it. Yeah. You just, I think you do it on a blanket basis. You, you don't try to target individuals. This stuff, this is one reason why, you know, Obama's so-called rescue of, 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 of uh, uh, people in, with mortgage distress never worked in the in America. They had to, they're supposed to be, you know, something like a million people were supposed to get their mortgages fixed up. Uh, it was order of a thousand people that actually got any benefit out of it because the, the, the bureaucratic uh, way of, of handing out the, the health right. never got there. You have to say this sector is going to be affected. We're giving every firm in this sector amount of money proportional to so that. So do you think we will? Share of the do you think, okay, do you think we will get there? Because this could go one of two ways. I think I we'll be forced into it. Right. I think we'll be forced into it. In the next few months? Because this, in the next few months, because with a doubling rate of every six days, I mean, just to... I, I used to be able to do this stuff in my head. Are you, are you ready to climb Mount Kosciuszko if this doesn't happen, by the way? I mean, you're in Australia now. You're quite, yep. hand, you're quite handy for it. If we don't see, what, well, what is almost your people's jubilee? If this doesn't, if we don't see that happening, this, this debt jubilee, people's debt jubilee happening in the next few months, you're, you're, you've got to go back up that mountain, Steve Yeah, then we're in serious <laughs> trouble, and I'm willing to take a bet on it. I mean, because like, if, if you look at... Um, might uh, be a good place to be. might be the safest thing. place to be, mind you, the top of Mount Kosciuszko. <laughs> it would be. Um, but there's, 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 there's 365 days in a year, and the doubling rate is six, uh, six days at the moment, unless we manage to reach a level of quarantine like the um, like the uh, Chinese have done. Now, this is not going to happen. I'm not saying that this is not a prediction by any means. It's simply showing what happens if this rate of growth continues. Then that means that... <laughs> Um, within within one year, the number of people who will have the coronavirus will be two thousand million billion people. Of course, there aren't that many people. Mm. Okay, it's that's what happens when you have a doubling at every six. So days. I mean, then yeah, it, it to, all goes down to connectivity, doesn't it? Because the Spanish flu did yeah, reach a, did reach a third of the population, and we obviously are much more connected than we were in than we were in, then. In yeah. yeah. If you if you if you reduce the doubling rate. To um, to every thirty one days, which every every month rather than every week, effectively, then your number of infected cases is um, is down in the uh, thousands. Mm. You know, which would, so that that's the impact of being able to quarantine. So if you have if you have uh, if you can reach the doubling rate from every six days or every week, say every month 
then you reduce the number of infections from ridiculous, everybody on the planet's got to have it, to 3,500 cases. So yeah. isolation works, okay? So we have to find a way of isolating people and slowing down the transmission rate. And it, it, it does have an impact. It's, it's, we're talking exponential factors here, and people aren't used to thinking that way. Right. And that's the trouble. And the uh, argument we, there, the we argument are now there, having an exponential crisis. Right. So the argument there is very simple, isn't it? Contagion costs money. People need to be paid uh, because they've still got their, uh, their outstanding debt. So either we, we give them the money, or somehow we, we we stop money systems operating for a couple of months. We say, well, okay, yeah, banks yeah. banks are not no, going, just, banks just, are not going. I mean, there's another yeah, way. Why don't we say to banks, don't ask for uh, don't ask for mortgage repayments for the next few months. Just push it back on the end of everyone's mortgage. That would help. Yeah, surely. that sort of thing. I mean, and, and no, but the thing is, got to say, to landlords don't ask for rent. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is, we've, we've pushed out the whole idea of the you know the the rentier. Well, we've, we've created so many people who think they're, uh, land, they're uh, top landlords these days. They are not going to want to have their tenants being able to pay the rent. Right, but if they're not, got to get but, cash but, to people. Right, absolutely. But if those, uh, if if those, and we're out of time now. We've been talking for too long. But if they, if those landlords right. are are paying mortgages because you know they've they've leveraged the point, yeah, they need to check cascades through. Then you could say, yeah, well, okay, yeah. you're, not, you're not having to pay your mortgages, therefore you're not able to charge rent either. You know, we're going to make it a law for the next few months. You can't charge rent. Banks can't ask for mortgage repayments. That would be a big help, big step forward, wouldn't it? That's one way. We've got to find some way because we have to reduce this this contagion rate. And just to give you a few this, this ideas of scale, uh, if we have, um, if we reduce, we're living at the current doubling rate. It's literally billions of millions, billions, millions of billions of people, which of course means the entire population gets it. If we reduce it to every two weeks, then there'll be seventy million people. To get infected. If you reduce it to every month, there'd be three and a half thousand people who get it. Hmm. So the, the the impact of, of slowing down the contagion is huge. Right, I'm and not, so we have to say we have to do that. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm going to get a little food hatch fitted at the door of the studio. I'm not leaving. Uh, good there to talk. You go. Good to talk, Steve. Well, I hope you're okay in Australia. You've got to, you've got to fly back. Uh, wear a bag over your head. Yeah, I've got my masks with me. All right. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. See you soon. See you when you're back here. Thanks. <laughs> Cheers. Okay, man. Bye. Bye. And if you've not heard it before, that is an example of the Debunking Economics podcast. Steve Keen and I do this every week. This is just an extra one this week because of the coronavirus. But if you want to listen to the full version of each week's podcast, you need to become a subscriber at debunkingeconomics.com or you can become a supporter of Steve Keen on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash prof Steve Keen. And uh, we'll hopefully see you next week for another one. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.